I'm curious to know what's going on with hunger in the U.S. Wow. Okay. There's a there's a big question right there. Um, well, let's see. The U.S. unemployment rate, you know, is is been at some low double digits. The youth unemployment rate of 25 years and younger has been 24%, 25% of young people. Youth, African American youth, is at 50%. Um, for me, when I talk, when I hear hunger, I hear vulnerability. And I think of youth, and I think of single families, and I think of elderly, and I think of really where we're at as a society. And, and it's all just not adding up to a, 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 a good solution set. It's, there's, there's some rampant food insecurity, 36 million people in the U.S. Is it around or, what did, or is it higher? I don't know. My, my sense was know. it was around 36 million uh, and over 14 million of those are children um, that don't go to bed with their caloric intake satisfied. We have the food bank lines are around the corner in Monterey and in Santa Cruz and with Second Harvest Food Bank. They're distributing more food than they ever have. I mean, they're having, you know, to ask people to come back at times when food bags aren't prepared and the system's not ready to meet that much. So we have a strapped emergency food system that's receiving the pressure front end, front line. I mean, I think going to talk to Willie Elliott at, at Second Harvest Food Bank, he could just lay it right out for you that this isn't just here in Santa Cruz and Monterey, that across the country we're having extreme pressure on our emergency food services. Um, we have kind of food stamp participation in, in federal nutritional food supplement and aid programs, not at high rates of usage because the mechanics of the bureaucracy of administering the program and receiving the aid is too much of a barrier for many. Um, when we talk about you know certain populations that are most vulnerable here in California, the irony for me is always working in food is farm workers in the food system. That you know we have a system where at peak time maybe half a million um, farm workers are needed, and there's over a million in the state mm -hmm. with over 52 percent of them undocumented. Um, it creates an easily vulnerable and exploitable workforce. Um, that you know less than half are you know reading, writing, or speaking Spanish and English fluently, um, that over a quarter are indigenous and don't even speak Spanish or English and mm -hmm. are even a smaller subset and more distance, and that they're harvesting for a living but not harvesting enough to make a living to feed their families. When their average wage is between seven and $11,000 a year, uh, how do you support yourself and your family in this country? Um, so I think we have some significant hunger issues here, but it pales in comparison to some of the other regions you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So globally, we have a huge hunger issue. Now, the genetically modified, tech-savvy advocates will argue that it's merely a, an issue of changing our farming system. Mm -hmm. That if we create an efficient design, we'll reduce chemical usage, we'll increase genetically hybrided varieties of seed, and we'll produce more. The facts aren't in that that's a consistent situation. Uh, furthermore, it, it doesn't take into account that all along, many researchers and advocates and experts aren't talking about the problem with the production system. It's the problem with the distribution. Uh -huh. So again, when we talk about hunger, we need to look at distribution. If America, if everyone in America could equally consume over 3,000 calories of food, why aren't we <laughs> right now if that's there? You know, what, what is the distribution holdups? And, you know, that has to do with privilege and markets and, you know, less, you know, supported areas, whether it's urban or rural food deserts. We have areas where the retail food end of businesses, businesses where people shop and get their food from, from a business perspective, aren't looking at investing in certain types of communities. It just happens to be those certain types of communities are historically very vulnerable and excluded communities. That they don't value the spend in that community because they don't see the benefit. Uh, so you won't have a Whole Foods opening up in East Oakland. And, uh -huh. uh, you, I mean, so, and that's probably what they don't need is another mm -hmm. Whole Foods. Right. They just need healthy access to fresh food in a, in a more consistent fashion. And again, do we, we can't depend on an emergency food system to supply that. I think there are great models, uh, and I think that in dark times, it's good to look at points of light, mm -hmm. as well as recognize the challenges we're in. Uh, I don't like to be a pessimist. You know, I don't. 
I don't think being an optimist is the right tone right mm -hmm. now. So yeah. we need to be real with each other and real with our communities. So because of this hunger issue in the Central Coast, we see the advancement of peer-to-peer -peer food serving efforts, like Grey Bears that mm -hmm. I touched upon, uh -huh. um, like Ag Against Hunger, where they're gleaning, you know, getting millions of pounds of produce into food banks and food situations to get to the most vulnerable. That the communities are attempting to respond to the call, but again, it's this tricky situation that I've come up against in many occasions. Do we focus on the miracles of communities and their wherewithal and ignore the structure that's causing the structural problems? Mm -hmm. Or can we somehow thread those together? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to do exactly, is we need to maintain our community engagement, but we need to also direct some of that energy into some of the more structural issues in this food system mm -hmm. that's preventing an inability for really good distribution measures and models to be employed uh, and causing, you know, rampant strife and in, in, in equitable access to food, healthy, fresh food. It sounds like so. a combination of, a, of a, a reactive and a proactive strategy working together. That's what it sounds like when you're talking about weaving these two yeah, things Yeah, that's in. a really good point. There is a lot of anger, frustration. Uh, there is a lot of need to react mm -hmm. to what's not working. Um, the proactive part involves a little crystal ball visioning, a little mm -hmm. sightseeing down, down the way a, a bit. And I was particularly recently inspired by this guy, Noah Thompson, unrelated to food but he is a master navigator in, in cultivating a traditional Polynesian form of voyaging that has been nearly forgotten in Polynesia, bringing in someone from Micronesia, Micronesia nearly on their deathbed, educating people about forms of navigation. And the, the way this really hits into hunger and food for me is uh, master navigators don't use the technological equipment of, of mm. modern day navigation. They learn how to navigate with the sun and the stars and the moon mm -hmm. and the weather and the birds. And they chart a course to Tahiti from Hawaii. And, and they've done this voyage now twice. And they're planning an around-the-world trip for seven years with different parts of it to educate around the role of master navigators. And it's, it's also this concept, I guess, in, uh, in Ghana. It's called Sankopa. Mm -hmm. Looking, you know, one step you know, backward, but looking forward is this, you know, recognizing and bringing the history forward, what's been lost in the craziness of today, and, and somehow holding a vision of what's to come. And so if you can imagine a navigator navigating from the sh off the shores of Hawaii and seeing Tahiti. Mm -hmm. So we need to somehow see what a healthy, real food system looks like for everyone. And then we need to get on board with the right tools to get us there. And I think the problem is also in what we're being proactive about is maybe we're not seeing that vision all the way down the road right. And then the differences of the tools we're using. Uh, I, I'm not an advocate for a, a mono anything approach. Mm -hmm. I think that we need resilience and resilience in nature mirrors itself on diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can appreciate whether it's technological focused individuals looking for technological means towards advancing and reducing hunger and, and, and supporting anti-hunger efforts. Um, and I can also appreciate some of the more historical approaches that have looked at how communities have been fed and cared for and, and how those relationships have sustained them. And I think we're going to need to see a, a merging of both of those into the future. So.